Thank you everybody for joining us this evening. We thought we will begin uh, our event. Uh, hope everybody managed to get some of the lovely soup. Um, very lucky to have uh, wonderful local businesses that cook such delicious and wholesome food, especially on these cold evenings. It's lovely to have some of that delicious food. Uh, I'm Mayor Annette Deeth and I am opening tonight's session uh, on behalf of Council here with Dr. Robert Gordon. A few housekeeping moments. Uh, toilets are just here to the right at the back and we do have two emergency exits if we do need to uh, exit the building for any, any reason at all. I would like to acknowledge other council laws that are here with us this evening. We have Councillor Janet Pearce, our Deputy Mayor, Councillor Jennifer Anderson and Councillor Mark Ridgway. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of which we are meeting, the Zha Zha Rung, and that the Macedon Ranger Shire Council has three traditional owner groups, which also incorporates the Wurundjeri Wurrung and the Tungurung peoples. If there's anybody here this evening that identifies as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, welcome. And we pay respect to your elders past, present and emerging. And we thank our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community for your wonderful contribution to our community here in the Macedon Ranges. So, I feel we're very fortunate this evening to have Dr. Rob Gordon here with us uh, and that we're in a position to be able to run this session. So, on the evening of 9th of June 2021, we will all remember uh, the significant event that happened uh, across the state but also had a very big impact on us here in the Macedon Ranges. Thousands of residents across the state, houses, fences, our beautiful natural environment were really impacted by those devastating winds that, that ripped across the state. Uh, many roads were closed uh, and I know we'll all have many memories of this. We have some staff here in the room that were on the ground at that point in time. Some of us here uh, may have been uh, experiencing and having impact on your own property or trying to get somewhere and roads were closed. Our former mayor who was here was out on the ground after that event uh, to uh, see what was going on and to work with the residents and the emergency services uh, that were in attendance. So we all have our own stories um, around how that has impacted us since that devastating event in June 2021, now um, over two years ago. And we know that recovery has been ongoing for many of us. So whether that's been mental, um, uh, you know, mental health and thinking about how we have responded to that, but then also the physical recovery as well. So a very big event uh, for us to experience here in the Macedon Ranges. And, and since 2019, we've had nine declared emergencies in the Macedon Ranges. So we are going to see more events like this into the future. Unfortunately, we don't want that to happen, but to be realistic, we know that's going to be the case. So we had the June 2021 storm event, and then unfortunately, just over 12 months later in October last year, the state had the significant flooding event also. Even though Macedon Ranges wasn't as impacted as some of the other local government areas, our town of Darawit Gwim was significantly impacted. And that was a very different response and a very different event to what we experienced with the storms and needed a different approach, needed a different way to work together as a community uh, to overcome the challenges that we were experiencing through those severe storm events. We are resilient though. We are a wonderful community that we know how to come together in those moments of trauma and work together to help each other to do what we need to do to get through that. But unfortunately, it's not just about our natural weather events. We've also been experiencing COVID. We've now also got cost of living pressures and it just keeps on adding up. At the moment, it feels like there's just one thing after another after another. So yes, we're resilient and we're great at coming together as a community, but it's okay to acknowledge that we might not be okay as well. And what tools do we have to support each other and ourselves as we keep experiencing the cumulative effect of trauma of all of these events as they keep eventuating? I'd like to note that we have the VCC emergency, crisis in emergencies, a policy, my that emergencies ministry. We have Rosie here who's leading the team, VCC emergencies ministry. Um, 
They provide a great service where you're able to have a conversation. So this evening, if you'd like to have a talk with somebody as well, please reach out to Rosie and the team. They'll be in a position uh, to have that conversation. So just want to acknowledge that we know the journey has been different for everybody and has impacted us all differently. But as residents of the Macedon Rangers, we are all feeling what our community has gone through. So I'd really like to thank you all for coming tonight and for listening uh, to Dr. Rob Gordon. It's wonderful for you to take the time to be here and I know this can help keep the conversation going too. So what we hear tonight not only will support us here in the room, but we can take it back to our families, our networks, our community groups, and keep sharing the tools and conversations that we'll have with you this evening. So tonight's not about me, it's about hearing from uh, Dr. Rob Gordon. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you for coming. Cheers. So good evening, everyone. Um, uh, I started with disasters in Ash Wednesday and in Macedon and um, uh, two years after that fire there was another fire around Maryborough and uh, I was part of a children's hospital team visiting here on a regular basis and then after two years found myself visiting two communities that were two years apart in their recovery and I started to see patterns and made me interested in what happens both to individuals and families but also to whole communities. Because one of the important things about disasters is that they are by definition community events. If it doesn't have a broad community impact we just call it a trauma and it affects the people that it affects. But uh, you don't have to have had the the really hard damage of the situation to be affected. And uh, there are a number of different dimensions to this which I want to talk about in both in terms of recovery but also in terms of how we get ready for whatever's ahead of us. <coughs> you know that can be best illustrated. We ha had a, an American professor who's done a lot of wonderful research come out a few years ago and give a presentation. He was in New Orleans just before he moved in, just before Hurricane Katrina arrived. So afterwards he, he did a whole lot of research and they interviewed 3,000 people in New Orleans. And he started off by presenting a map of New Orleans and all these 3,000 people were identified as dots you know, where they lived. And they were colour coded according to how severely they felt their lives had been affected by this event. And the map was shaded according to the depth of water. So he starts off by asking, what's the relationship between the depth of water and the uh, severity of impact? And everyone looked and looked and looked. And eventually someone says, I can't see any relationship and he says, no, that's right, there is no relationship. We've done all the mathematics, there's no uh, statistical relationship. And I think this is something that gets lost in the uh, focus on the physical impact. Of course, when you lose your house or your house is damaged or uh, you have lots of physical losses, sheep, cattle, fences, that's where the focus goes. But um, you know, if you think about it, the physical losses are reversible eventually in some form. You mightn't end up with as good a house as you had if you weren't well insured, but you'll eventually probably end up in a house of some sort and it'll be surprisingly quickly filled up with stuff. Um, but if people don't keep track of their lives during the recovery process, particularly I noticed between about six months and uh, two to three years, then they can suffer uh, problems which are not reversible because they're not material, the problems in their lives which are uh, at risk of being irreversible. But because they're happening afterwards, Maybe they weren't necessary. We can't do anything about the initial impact. We'd have to stop the disaster. 
but we can think about this psychosocial, we say, psychological and social community consequences. I want to speak a little bit about that, bearing in mind that you're uh, what, uh, just a bit over two years down the track. Um, and uh, you still worry about strong winds, don't you? Uh, now, let's talk about that for a moment, because that ties you to the event, doesn't it? And this is part of the nature of trauma. The word trauma in Greek means wound or injury or damage. So trauma medicine is the medical care of people who've been externally injured rather than sick. You know, you're run over by a bus rather than having a heart attack. And the psychological trauma is the same. Something happens to you that injures you. How do we know you're injured? Because you don't recover easily or quickly. And when you still have the heebie-jeebies every time the wind blows two and a half years later, there's something in the nature of recovery hasn't quite happened, has it? And if you're not careful, every time you go into the heebie-jeebies, it's like you reopen the wound. Um, and if that happens regularly, your whole sense of security and safety has changed. Is it? Uh, and um, I know in the Dandenongs there are people that have moved off the mountain because they just don't feel safe again. Um, now, um, <clears throat> you know, what, what's damaged here is some of the fundamental underpinnings of our experience of nature, the world and so on. We, we grow up uh, and you know, we go through life and experiences and storms and winter and so on. And when things happen in certain patterns, predictably, you know, our nervous system has to kind of make order and simplify things. So we, we kind of group things together and make assumptions about them. And once we've made an assumption, we don't need to give it any attention any, anymore, do we? And therefore, we free our mind to dealing with uh, what is important, the things that uh, are changing all the time, like me giving a talk. Now, here's the point. We don't know what our assumptions are because they're assumed. And when the trauma comes, it damages an assumption you didn't realise you had. And so now, how do you have a frame of reference to work out whether this wind or rain, I've just come down from Rochester, they've all got the heebie-jeebies every time it rains. Or it could be anything. Uh, how do you work out whether this is dangerous and you should go into alert, or whether it's just ordinary stuff that you've had for decades before and didn't take any notice of? Oh, it's windy tonight, did I bring the washing in, sort of thing. Um, let me illustrate that. Um, which of you, when you came into this hall this morning, this afternoon, had a look around and asked yourself the question, is this built to earthquake codes so that if we have an earthquake in about 15 minutes, it'll be okay? Did any of you give any thought to that? No, why not? We've had a few earthquakes recently, haven't we? No, they're in Gippsland, we shouldn't need to worry about it. Can you see you've got an assumption, haven't you? I've done a lot of work with uh, Christchurch uh, people for years. They became incredibly skilled. As soon as they heard a rumble, that even about four years later, they'd say, earthquake, truck, earthquake, truck, earthquake, truck, truck, it's a truck, it's okay, it's a truck, quarry truck going past. Um, and they could uh, actually predict what the Richter rating would be for the aftershocks. They got very skilled because they tuned in and listened to it and, and felt it. It's part of their experience. So you're worried about, sorry to spoil your evening, you're worried about storms and floods, but we won't get an earthquake, says he smiling. <laughs> Just to surprise you. No, but ser the serious thing is, this is the nature of trauma, that something damages the fabric of your reality, our reality. 
and it doesn't feel safe. Now, if you go into post-traumatic stress, you treat every event that's like it as the same, and you go into uh, threat. You go into high arousal and you feel very scared. I work with a man who uh, was involved in a, a, a criminal event where guns were discharged and uh, it was very dangerous. He wasn't injured, other people were. Uh, but now, even years later, if he's sitting in a cafe and somebody drops uh, a coffee cup, he doesn't just jump. His whole body goes into getting ready to die and the rest of the day is a write-off. Even now, when we've done a lot of work, his rational mind says, look, I know it's not going to happen, but it might. And my body gets ready. There's nothing I can do about it. And uh, that means he's reopening his wound, isn't he? Because the rest of the day is a write-off because he's had a really horrible experience in that moment. And uh, th this is something, this is what we call post-traumatic stress. And I say to him, you're not going to be involved in a shooting again. This is not the United States. You've probably never come across an event where somebody discharged a gun for the rest of your life. The most likely situation for you to be killed or injured is to drive to me for an appointment. And he laughs. Because he said, I'm not worried about this at all. Uh, I'm only worried about what triggers the, we use this word, what triggers the reaction. And uh, this is a really important thing that now he is, part of his problem is he didn't get any help for his reactions for quite some weeks afterwards. He did what a lot of people do. Afterwards, he just went home. He didn't know what he should do. And uh, why did he go home? He's always looked after himself. He's never been someone who needed counselling or anything like that. What do you do after your, your world has been disrupted? You try and go back to your, your routine. And uh, so he went home. But he carried home, and you know, he drove home uh, 10 kilometres, went inside and locked the doors, and worked out the, the most walls between him and the outside if he s sat next to the bathroom door. Uh, so he's sort of imagining that the gunman is going to follow him. The gunman was already apprehended. So in that way, we'll often take the traumatic event with us. And when we're around about this sort of period, uh, it becomes really important that we begin to work with that experience actively, which means, uh, you know, we, a lot of uh, brain science are now understanding, because when you go into high arousal, there's a really primitive instinctive part of our brain that, that switches on. That's why we do surprising things. Did you find yourselves doing surprising things in the middle of the storm? Um, uh, you know, people often, if they haven't done any preparation, do things that they look back on and uh, think that was stupid. In fact, up at R Rochester, uh, there was a woman there told me about her adult, young adult daughter, who, when they had to rapidly uh, evacuate, what she evacuated was with was six pairs of bathers and a beanie. <laughs> she, she couldn't actually, with her, her uh, great drawer full of stuff, she didn't take any undies or, or any uh, other clothes to change into, you know, uh, why would she take six pairs of bathers? Why would you have six pairs of bathers? I'm just a male, I don't know. But, uh, but uh, there are many stories of that sort because when you go into that state, Unless you've done the thinking beforehand, you can't think things out. You're just going to react and do the first thing that comes into your head. And we now know that's because you're in a very simple part of your brain that's going to cut things down very, very sharp and simply to help you survive. I call that survival mode. Adrenaline is the, the sort of chemical that's, that's going. We all know what it's like straight into action. And I want to come back to that when we talk about preparedness. <clears throat> and so in, in this sort of situation, people uh, will often end up doing things which make things more complicated and more disturbing because 
they find out they, they can't quite trust themselves. But isn't it important that we can learn? I said to her, I bet she won't take them next time. And living in poor old Rochester, there may be a next time. Um, you know, so yes, she's got a bag of stuff that she's going to take, you know, so she's learned. And uh, what, we, what we have to understand is that, that, uh, that in, in managing it, we've got to use the part of our brain that is uh, the rational human thinking, decision making, learning, rational part of our brain. Um, and so when the wind blows, the reptile brain is saying, oh, it's happening again, and it won't have any language. Reptiles don't speak, do they? They grunt and scream and make noises. Uh, uh, so it's, it's going to just give you this massive stimulation uh, of uh, emotion. I have this story, which I won't go into in long detail, where my wife and I were walking down a, uh, uh, from a, a, an attempt to have a picnic in the Yarra Valley. We were walking down a big bulldozed track, one of the mountains there. And my wife stops and says, is this the rock face that the guidebook says is a crown formation? And I'm standing here and say, no, I can't see any crown formation. She says, is it behind that tree there? And I say, uh, and I hear a scraping noise. And then I look there and there's a tiger snake reared up like this, wriggling vigorously towards her legs. She's there. What do you think I do? Don't tell it. <laughs> Pardon? Don't tell it. Well, you can come up with lots of things, um, but I didn't do anything, something happened, right? You know that feeling where you don't decide to do something and carry out an action, something happens. What happened was, oh! and I whacked her on the shoulder, she went, eek! and the snake goes into the bush. It was a perfectly adequate, well-rehearsed <laughs> response to the problem, right? Isn't it? That's all that was needed. But that could be computed directly from the, the, the relationship, the space, the distance between me and the snake and her and the snake. After this, when I walked down, I thought to myself, and I looked inside, I thought, there's no possibility that I could have produced even a word. Have you ever had that sense? Now, that's the feeling of being in your reptile brain. There's no language in there. Language is up here. Now, that's going to trigger off, and often people don't know what their triggers are. They, they could be, it, it's very common in bereavement, for instance, that people will start to feel terrible in the lead up to an anniversary event, their loved one's birthday. Uh, the, usually they know the anniversary's coming up, but, or some other marker. Uh, that, that has to do with the person they've lost. Before they've actually stopped and thought about it, they're starting to notice they feel really sad. Uh, because there's a deep part of us that, that lives in the routines and rhythms of life. And uh, that part is sort of starting to feel, my loved one's not here, they should be. And so, uh, this, this uh, process of recovering from it is to put it back there. Now, how worried were you about storms before? You yeah, probably the odd storm. Did you have the odd tree or branch blown down before? Uh, so you've got a set of assumptions about storms that have been completely trashed, haven't they? So now, how do you re-establish the assumptions? Well, you have to, I think, we've got to use a language and thinking and knowledge and science and uh, meteorology and to start to rebuild because what we've got to do is rebuild assumptions. How do assumptions get formed? By the repetition of the same events time after time and in the end we don't have to think about them. We just, we just put them away. I can now focus on uh, what the speaker's saying instead of whether the roof is going to stay up because I've never had a roof fall in while I'm having a, a talk. Uh, if it did, we did have an earthquake, how would you feel if Kerry puts out a uh, notice saying, I've got this very interesting speaker coming up from Melbourne to talk to you again? 
you, you wouldn't want to come, would you? That would be the associations. Even the word Kerry would make you turn green. Uh, and so in that part of our brain, there are lots of associations. We learn by association. In this part of our brain, we learn by, by logic and reason and cause and effect and all that stuff. So what becomes really important is that people start to engage with this experience and talk yourselves through it. That means reading the, uh, reading the weather map and the weather forecast. This, you know, finding out what, what were the circumstances when it happened. Have you ever had a, a, someone explain what happened in that storm? Why it happened? Uh, it would be, I think it would be very interesting to have a little sheet of paper uh, available in the community or in the newsletter on Facebook or something where you could actually go and see what the map looked like. Um, I know that um, in the 2011 floods, uh, there was a lot of flash flooding out in the Grampian, so I went out to uh, one of the little communities there in the middle of winter and, and uh, was giving a talk in a little uh, sporting pavilion. It was dark everywhere, the wind was blowing and the rain started to fall and there was a woman sitting two or three rows back and uh, as I was talking, she had tears running down her face. I thought, my goodness, am I being insensitive? Uh, I said, excuse me, have I said something to upset you? She said, no, it's just the rain. I always cry when it rains. Keep going, keep going. Uh, and, and I went on with my talk. She came up at me afterwards. Now, this is an example of who's affected and who's not. She came up to me afterwards and said, I've lived here for 20 years in this little valley. There's never been a flash flood. But on that day, I went to my back doorstep and I saw a tsunami coming down the valley halfway up the level of the gum trees and I thought, I'm dead. Right? This was a little while after the Fukushima. Everyone has been watching those tsunamis. So tsunami, the very word. Right? Now, halfway up the trees. Now, she would never have experienced how this is going to distribute the water by the time it gets to her place. In the event, it just lapped up against her back doorstep. There was no problems. But she faced death, didn't she? And that's an irreversible change in your life, to face death. But nothing happened. Which teaches me that the trauma is not what happened necessarily, it might be, it's what you think is going to happen. And unless you give that a respect uh, and pay attention to it and work with it, such as, why didn't I die? Uh, right? That's a good question. Why didn't I die? But people often don't ask that. They don't go past that moment of, <gasps> it might not be death, it might be injury, it might be loved ones, uh, I've lost people, I don't know where they are. The issue of um, being unable to get access, we know is a, a very big emotional stress. The uh, Beyond Bushfire uh, research from Black Saturday has shown that people who were separated from contact with their loved ones on, at uh, Black Saturday for any length of time, had poorer health, mental health, that showed, I think, at least up to five years. I don't know whether it's still evident in the 10 year, but, but you know, it had a very strong, because why? Because it's what they're thinking about as they hear about people dying. You know, you start thinking now. Uh, I call that an informational trauma as opposed to the actual experience of being there and having the sensory impressions, the trees falling, the loud wind, that's a sensory trauma. And uh, the, once you think something's gonna happen, your whole reptile brain get, and body get ready for it. Now my experience working with people that have been through is that mobilization and get, getting ready is in a very deep instinctive part of your brain and you stay in that process of being ready until you reverse it. But you don't realise you need to reverse it because you can't find anything up here where you're used to looking. What you need to do is go really through the experience, but I don't want to go back there, I don't want to remember it, it upsets me. No, you need to go back through it carefully and look for the moment of greatest threat and ask yourself, what did I think? What did I do? How did I get ready? 
you know, what, what, what was my sense of, of the future? And then say, but what actually happened? What you, you notice is that people will routinely tell their story up to that moment and they don't go on with the narrative. Instead, they go into their emotions or they go into being angry at services that they expected to be there who weren't, or they get cross about not enough burn off, burn off was done, or uh, you know, they're very upset in, uh, in uh, Rochester about the fact that uh, Lake Eberlock is full to the brim. They're very upset in uh, Yarra Ranges because uh, uh, Eildon is full to the brim. You know, they wanted it to be, so that there's a fixation on these things this doesn't help our recovery because uh, the decision of water authorities to alter the level of the lake is not just responsive to the anxiety of community members downstream. There are, whole, there are contracts, there's policies, there's legislation, there's, you know, there's interest group. People own certain stratas of the water, apparently. <laughs> this much from here to here belongs to this and this. And, uh, oh, it's too complicated for me. I'm just a psychologist. so. Uh, but if you do that, you lose control of your recovery because your recovery then means the water authority has to do what will make you feel better. And uh, they're not going to. They're going to do what, you know, hopefully they will do something, but uh, they may not do what you want. And so uh, what's, what's so important is for people to uh, keep hold of the experience they've had and put the whole story there. Now, when they stop at that moment and they go, as they remember, they go into the high arousal, the peak of emotion, and then they lose the narrative and go into emotion, fear, anger, blame, whatever. I call that the ad break. You know, on TV, you have an ad break at the most exciting moment because they want you to watch the ads and see what happens. The ad break shows that there's a different memory system. There's the memory of the danger. And then if you ask them, don't ask them. Now, us counsellor types, our instinct is, oh, you must have felt terrible and go into the feelings. Well, then you just go around the loop. And that's the post-traumatic loop. I thought I was going to die because the roof fell in. But we need to ask some very simple questions. At that point when it was most dangerous and you thought something terrible is going to happen, what happened next? That's all. What happened next? And you'll notice they stop and do a double take and say, oh, uh, uh, oh that's right, I did this, that or the other. Um, and, uh, and what happened then? And they, oh, they did this. And all of those memories are associated with survival. So they're bringing their arousal and the tension and the stress down, aren't they? So I think from working with people, we must have two separate memory loops. One's the high threat, high arousal memory loop. Actually, it'll be deep down in our brain. And the other's the reducing threat, reassuring memory loop, into which all information that is to do with survival and reducing threat goes, which is going to be up here somewhere. And we don't spontaneously put them together because when we get to that high mode, we rupture the narrative and we go round that little bit of fragment of loop. And what we need to do is go right through how we survived. When I was in Malakuta after the fires there, uh, about four people on different occasions told me, asked me if I'd seen the young firefighter who thought he was going to die out the back of his house. I never did. But what they would say is, oh, you really ought to see him. He's very traumatised because he went to protect his house. He went out the back of his house. He had his gear on. And uh, when the fire erupted from the forest, it was so huge, he thought he was going to die. And he's very traumatised. You should really see him. Now, what are you curious about? How he survived because he's still alive, they're worried about him, right? Nobody showed the slightest trace of knowledge of how he survived. So the story's actually going around and traumatising the community with this fragment of his experience. Something must have happened. It wasn't as bad as he thought, or he had his gear on, 
or he turned the hose on himself, or he ran around the right side of the house. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. He, now, if he can't retrieve those memories, he can't retrieve his sense of competence and trust in himself. And I could give examples where people have, have come to me uh, and told me stories where they felt incredibly guilty and bad, but they did something stupid and put themselves at risk. Uh, like the woman in uh, Kangaroo Island who, who uh, refused to evacuate the day before and when the fire was coming, she, she thought, uh, uh, I'm going to have to get out of here, what will I do? And she grabbed her, her teenage daughter and they drove to a hillside that had been burnt. Once they got there, she said, I realised this was a really bad idea, this has got, still got a lot of stuff, we're not safe. And what happened? I just froze, she said. And then she looks at me and talks about how guilty she feels, how she's failed her role as a mother. Pretty serious trauma, isn't it? And what happened, I say? Eventually, my daughter said, well, shouldn't we drive down to the other end of the island? And I sort of said, uh, all right. And so uh, we jumped in the car and then she describes how she drives carefully onto the road, puts herself right in the middle and as soon as the smoke clears, she flattens it to the next uh, smoke uh, bank and then crawls along the right line and then, you know, and in this way she, she drives very competently. Now two people died on that road and we know people run off the road, don't we, when they can't see and they die. She was not going to run off the road. She, and I said, you did a beautiful job. No, but I should have thought about it. Uh, why didn't you thought about it? And she tells me the, the reasoning she had before and I said, what would have happened if your daughter hadn't suggested uh, uh, I suppose I would have thought of it myself because it was the only thing to do yeah how long do you reckon that would have taken uh, how long do you think she thought that gap was about a hundred years in high arousal uh, it, it just seems an unmeasurable amount of time that put my our lives at risk but it's not it's probably a, a few seconds uh, and probably their lives are not going to uh, depend on a few seconds. It would if there was a, I don't know, a truck coming. Uh, but no, she, she did a great job. I said, what will you do next time? She said, I'll be gone the day before. Great, you've learned. So, you know, she doesn't need to focus on uh, a, an emergency procedure that she wasn't trained for and didn't, hadn't gone to enough meetings in the community like this. Uh, and got herself properly ready. So she, was, she, she fumbled and bumbled and got there. That's all we can ask and learn. And so, uh, th now, what do you need for this? You don't need a counsellor or a psychologist. You just need somebody to be interested in your story, don't you? And to, to not get hooked up into their emotions, but to keep your own perspective and say, that's curious, they thought they were going to die, but they're here. And just be, just be curious and interested, how come you did survive? Or uh, how come you didn't take this or whatever? Just ask them to tell a story. Now, what this suggests is that although we have to use in the, in the aftermath to re-establish our sense of security, confidence, stability in our community, in our world, we have to process the events. We have to process the triggers uh, and, and stop and think about it. Um, a, a woman told me after Black Saturday she was driving through the Christmas Hills down to Yarra Glen to, to a meeting. And uh, it was the middle of winter by now, six months later. She said, I drove around, around the corner and hit a fog bank. It was fog this time. And she said, I started to have a panic attack. I started to hyperventilate and I had to pull over and stop and, and, and start quiet breathing and steady breathing, etc. Now, if she calms herself down like that and says, okay, I've mixed this up. Uh, I've grey, fluffy stuff is not always life-threatening smoke. Uh, and, you know, talked herself down then uh, and not avoided driving on foggy days, 
but actually prepared herself. Um, it's fog. I'm going to drive in the fog. It's a little bit upsetting, but it'll be okay. Slowly it will subside. And one of the things we know from all the research about post-traumatic stress is avoidance perpetuates it. Exposure in a controlled way when you feel in charge and confident uh, helps you reduce it because you sur keep surviving the experience. Um, and now that's what everyone has to do to whatever your triggers are, stormy winds, dark nights, time of the year. Uh, there can be all sorts of cues. I live in Yarra Glen. I reckon it took my wife and I about four years not, you know, we didn't get the fire over us, luckily, the, not luckily for us, but uh, fortunately for Liara Glen, the wind changed and it blew off up to Steeles Creek where it did a lot of damage. And uh, on that day, uh, the, the, it was an incredibly blustery north wind until it changed. And even in the winter, for about four years, when there was a blustery north wind with drizzle on it, we would just feel unsettled and agitated. Um, it doesn't happen now, but we, you know, would comment on, it's that north wind again. It's the way the trees were moving. Uh, you know, that was the stimulus, the way the, the trees, uh, and, and just that sense of this very violent, blustery wind. So. I think it's important to understand there's a trajectory. Now, how do you get it into perspective? By going through the same season a few times and have nothing bad happen. There's no other way, is there, to restore your confidence and, and sense of uh, uh, predictability about nature than to go through it again. That means uh, you've got to be prepared to engage with the weather conditions and think about what they are. I said to this woman in uh, uh, the Grampians, I said, you know, remember the, there was a decaying cyclone from Western Australia and a decaying, in 2011, a decaying cyclone from Queensland and they actually crossed like an X. And we get that pattern, those patterns, if you watch the weather maps, uh, every now and again. But it was the, the actual timing was such that they dumped all their spare water in central Victoria. And I said, that's what she's got to look at, because as soon as she looks at the weather map, she will be able to see whether this is flood rain or not. Uh, and now all we have to do is pull our phones out, don't we? Uh, and see the radar and we'll see how much rain's behind it and how long it'll take to get through. Uh, so, so, so it, we won't do that if we go straight into anxiety. We'll be repeating the pattern. And so in this sense, I think it's so important to be actively engaging instead of avoiding. Uh, it's going to be a stormy night. I'm going to go and stay with my friends down on the Mornington Peninsula uh, or something. No, no, really have a look, understand it. And, you know, sort of put the thread into perspective and give yourself time. And I think we could also, you know, make sure you're with people if it's gonna be a storm. Be with people that will help you feel uh, comforted and confident. But in, it's hard to do this processing of the day if you've got things that happened. And I know from working with people in the, in the Dandenongs that uh, many people had some very serious near misses. Uh, they didn't always know about it at the time, but in the morning they came out and said, well, if it fell that way instead of this way, you know, we, we probably wouldn't be here. Isn't it merciful that we didn't have any deaths? Uh, so uh, elements of the trauma might come in a little bit later. And, uh, you know, I think it's so important to, to be able to tell the story so that it can be put in the past. It's only when we tell a story, make a narrative of it, that it becomes past experience, where we can say, I can remember that I had a bad experience two years ago and I was very upset afterwards for quite a long time. But now I'm talking about a memory of an emotion instead of having the emotion. When we're too raw, as soon as we talk, we'll, we'll arc up and, and start to feel distress. Now, we can do that in all sorts of ways. We can journal, we can talk to our family, uh, but 
often when people are very close, they have slightly different needs. One person wants to talk about a lot, the other one wants to put it aside. One person's still worried about it, somebody's not. But, but I think this is where community comes in and being able to share your story to each other in the community and just be interested in each other's story. And as time goes by, how is it? How is it now two years later? What are you still thinking about? Now, I can tell you from the understanding of recovery, there are a lot of people that don't come forward early on. They put their energy into sorting things out. Why? Because they've never been used to using government services. They, they do them, things themselves. But the need for government services after disasters is based on how severely you're affected. So the people who haven't been used to using government services don't think about that for a long time. Uh, they think, oh, well, you know, I wasn't badly off with somebody else and I can do it, I'm, I'm okay. And they keep working. Now they move into this period of tremendous hard work of recovery. Uh, it may be hard work because you've got to rebuild things and, and talk to insurance companies and get m timber moved or whatever. Or it may be just the hard work of dealing with your emotions and the disruption. Maybe your business is affected. There's a whole lot of indirect ways in which you'll be disturbed. And uh, when that happens, uh, you, you miss out on really important time, which is the time to just relax put things into perspective um, and build that sense of the past. This has happened before. You, if, you, if you're so busy all the time, uh, you lose a process I call mulling. Mulling is when you, you're just freewheeling in your mind. Mulling. That's when we do a very important uh, process of, of digesting our experience, which is uh, being able to get it into perspective, uh, being able to think about other aspects. If you don't do that, and all we need to not do that is be trivially busy for a long time, then you, you have a curious sense of distorted time frame. Did you notice that some, in some ways it feels as though it's been a very long time, in other ways it feels as though it's hardly any time before? particularly when you get reactivated. It's like it, it only happened a, sh a short time ago. So two years, my goodness, where's the time gone? Because that sense of having an appropriate sense of time means we've organised our memories. We don't do that when we're very busy all the time. And uh, therefore, I think one of the best things we can do is to have opportunities to meet and talk and, and share. People tend not to do it in their intimate relationships because they're going through it together. We don't want to talk about it, we're going through it. We want to talk about something else. But to actually talk to other people and say, well, how's it for you? Or what have you been doing? And, and, and you, you, you have to kind of uh, pull, pull your experience together and present it. And that's when it starts to get sorted into a perspective. It's a very important part of the recovery. We know that people who get involved in community events, uh, attend meetings, uh, and so on, do much better. They recover faster, they have uh, 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 lower levels of mental distress and so on, because they're getting support, but they're also having this help to, to digest their experience. So um, I wonder, um, well, I wonder whether this, anyone's got any questions about this. I want to talk a little bit more about the, some of the problems of the longer term recovery and then, yeah. If I heard you correctly, you said something along the lines of, you know, people are impacted two years later because they didn't process it at the time. Just it could be. The, so the I'll say it for the camera. Uh, people could be impacted because they didn't process it at the time. Yeah. yeah. I, they, they shut it down and got yeah. on with the, what they had to do. It makes sense, but I'm trying to place that um, with the, some literature that says when you're talking with people up immediately after a disaster, it may not help be helpful to have them relive the event or talk through the actual mechanics of the event. So we don't want them to relive it. Mm. 
we want them to represent it as a narrative, to talk about it, not to relive it. Just talking about it, relive it in their mind? If you emphasise the emotions. Okay, right. But if you ask them to tell you about the memories and the experience, they're going to have to separate themselves from it to describe it. And I think that's a fundamental, yes, I know the research you're talking about, um, and, and I, it doesn't make that distinction. But from my experience, if you talk to people and use an emotionally focused conversation, they just go into it again. That doesn't help at all. You, you need to calm them down. If they don't want to talk about it, fine, and some people won't. But there are a lot of people in the immediate aftermath that it's just, it's so, they can't get anything else I into their mind. They've got to talk about it because it's going round and round and round. And I think what's going round is that loop up to the ad break. And uh, I think there's research now to show that after a trauma, when that loop is, people are going, they, they can track that loop now with all the scans. And if that loop goes round and round and round, it starts to get hardwired in the brain. And then becomes very sensitive. That's what's happened to my client. He's gone round and round that loop for, for weeks. And it's very hard to shift it. And so as soon as possible for people to get out and have sensitive, appropriate support and opportunities to talk as they wish. Uh, there are a few perhaps people with emotional struggles already that might need to, you know, a bit of specialised help to calm them down. But, but most people, uh, I think, will benefit enormously by being able to talk about what's happened. What's happened. Yeah. Yeah. The, everybody just wanted to talk to me about it. I, as an erectile, I didn't want to talk about it. I wanted my animals to be safe, and I could not get any practical help because the response team just had no interest in helping farmers. But my issue was that most of my damage was done on boundary fences, a kilometre along the railway, which they took a couple of years to get around the planning up. But my neighbour from Massa refused to um, ask for help. He doesn't read English. He speaks it okay. But I've just watched him being hammered by council because his animals were getting out and he wasn't going to... He said, no, he came from a corrupt... He said, they're all corrupt. He wasn't going to talk to anyone. No. Therefore, he didn't get any assistance and he still has fences which need... Um, trees off them and to be repaired, but, um, but so presumably, if you don't, um, in the right culture, then you don't get help. That's yeah. Right. So uh, what you're saying is, people wanted to talk to you about how you yeah, felt. You had this little red cross lady in high heels <laughs> trot up to my door, and I'm just panicking because I need to make sure my animals don't yeah. get you out because. Your what the ranger wanted to do was find you for having an animal there. Mm. And I, I said, they're useless. If you can't, I need to pick up a chainsaw and start up chainsawing. I'll talk to you. But I'm not, she wanted to sit around my kitchen table. I didn't want to be in there. No. Sitting around the kitchen table I, I think, uh, you know, I think we hear these stories. These are, you know, people who've been trained to do that mm. um, and uh, are really highly focused on doing that. Uh, whether you want it or not. <laughs> uh, well, that's the only and it's a lack of experience, yeah, I think. There was no physical help for farmers yeah. at all. And what you're really describing, I, I think I, we would put it now, uh, that you were dealing with a system that wasn't sufficiently trauma-informed mm. to understand what Still might have been the traumatic background to your neighbours' yeah. attitudes. There'll be, he'll have a reason for being so suspicious um, and not being... So what you're saying is your animals were the priority. They were the threat. Yeah. So that's the focus of your... That's keeping your arousal up. Yeah. If you deal with that, your arousal will come down. You'll be ready to... Have to wait till it almost starts to leave because I'm still having problems yeah. with my fences and um, it's just too um, dangerous for me to leave home because yeah. things happen when I leave home. 
things go wrong with the animals. Yes. Yeah. So now that, that shows that all sorts of things can continue to be a threat. Uh, how long before that was sorted out for you? It still isn't. Still, so you're two years and you've still yeah. got this worry. Got so, so I would say... Because now they're wrapping up fines that I can't pay. Yeah. And I don't believe my animals have left on their own. Mm. They're not being pushed out or coaxed out. Because there's plenty... I had nothing wrong with my fences before the storms, after the storms. Um, there were lots of problems. My animal still didn't leave, but when I put a temporary fence up along the road just in case, the council came along and confiscated it because it was on their land without permission. And I'm still fighting. It's a thousand, a kilometre worth of electric fencing cost me a thousand dollars and I can't get anywhere with Hepburn Shire. They don't even believe that that was a problem for them to take it. And apparently they've demolished it because they and now I've got a thousand dollars worth of so, lines, but uh, actually my animals were out on the highway when I went away. So, weekend. I can't even go you, away. You're, you're talking about this now, yeah. you're not talking about the storm, you're talking about all yeah, of this. The storm wasn't the problem. Uh, so, this really means the you haven't been able to deal with your trauma that experience. Storm, I'm alive, I wake up, yeah. I got up the next morning, the first thing was to get out there and find my animals. But Basically, the wind was still blowing, so I just learned how to. Now, unfortunately, dodge the trees. being a mere it's psychologist. Down around me. Yeah, but being a mere psychologist, I'm not yeah, able to pick the phone up and tell somebody to fix it. No, uh, but but not. what I want to do is to use this example, which is yeah. a very, you know, very must be incredibly frustrating for you, to show how things that happen during recovery mm. block the processing of the event and lots of things happen during recovery and that's where I talk about uh, the the events the physical events followed by these other events which are often much more in the social world about relationships and what people do uh, there's finances involved and so on but and and uh, these are you could say unnecessary if people understood now I'm sure that everybody here, and I can see people nodding, I'm sure everybody here can relate to that, whether it be in their own personal life or... or and now this is where I want to... But, but before I go on, I wonder whether anyone else has got any thoughts or questions. Well, yeah. Just on a different topic. While you've been talking, I've been thinking about the COVID experience. Yes. Which I feel is traumatic. Yes. But I've been trying to sort of reclaim like, what's the trauma point you know, that you move into emotion and it's such a long extent of time. Yes. I, I'm struggling to apply the principles you're talking about, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's a connection there with a different uh, situation. Well, the, 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 there'll be some level of trauma around the sense that my, our sense of the security of our world has changed. Uh, our sense of how confident we feel to mix with each other. You know, obviously you guys have come out, uh, there are probably a lot of people who thought, I'm not going out there, I might catch COVID. Uh, and everything in between. Uh, uh, so that's a changed sense. And uh, people, I hear people on the radio saying they don't think that we're yet back to the kinds of uh, social patterns. You know, people in the city are saying uh, that people aren't using the city the way they used to and so on. Uh, so um, now that... Uh, touches a really important point, and that is that the word recover, if you look it up in the dictionary, I spent uh, quite a long time doing this one day, it comes into English around about Shakespeare's time, as many of the, our words did. And it means to regain a lost state of health, we recover from an illness, wealth, recover from a financial loss, or happiness, you recover your good disposition. All of those mean you get back to how you were before. But you, you're probably not going to get back to the way you were before with COVID. We're going to have a different world. We don't know what it's going to look like yet. The changes probably won't be the sort of things you can make Hollywood movies out of, but they'll be subtle that will shift a whole lot of things. Now, people don't want to go back to work in the office, do they? Well, some people can't wait to get back. 
other people don't want to go back. And you know, there's a whole lot of controversy about this. It's going to change just that bit. But I think there are, there are a number of things with COVID. Uh, first of all, some people love to be cooped up in the house if they've got a nice house and they like the people they live with. Other people feel, you know, I'm being stuck, I'm being coerced, I'm being, you know, locked down. Uh, and, and they have a very difficult time with a lot of anxiety and depression. We know that those have been huge. And uh, it provokes whatever other issues you had in your life before. Um, and, uh, you know, we know with family violence has gone up and a whole lot of other things. So there are certain things that put the whole social fabric under pressure. And everybody then goes into a certain state of arousal. How do we deal with this? As soon as we're doing something new outside our routines, we're in a state of arousal. It's not, it's not like uh, the threat of a dangerous thing. So the answer is to buy toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, wasn't that, wasn't that so interesting? Yeah. The panic of yeah. all the things. Uh, it becomes a symbol, doesn't it? I've got to get myself ready. That's like taking six pairs of bathers and a beanie, isn't it? So, um, now, I have a, a, a sort of metaphor for that. Uh, I think people adapted to, to that as best they could by actually shutting down certain expectations and focusing. That's what arousal does, it makes us focus. And that's a bit like a diver working at depth. Isn't it? There's a lot of pressure and they do their stuff. And they can do their stuff, the problem is when they come up isn't it? They get the bends. And so what we, if you, you know, I gave lots of presentations to work, work groups and uh, I said that when we come out of it, and we came in and out of it, didn't we, many times, um, that it's not, oh, thank goodness that's over. No, we feel just funny and different and unhappy in a different way. We bicker and, and argue and, and feel upset and anxious. Um, and I call that the decompression response, that, that the end of a period of stress is not necessarily return to normal, but uh, this sort of very uncomfortable adaptation process that, that I think people have to go through. And I'm glad you bring that up because we've got, uh, we've got uh, storms, floods, fires uh, and uh, COVID, and let's throw in uh, cost of living, financial issues. Um, so we aren't uh, anymore just dealing with isolated disasters. We've got a, a series of events happening on top of each other, which means we can't have a clear picture of event, recovery, event, recovery. We've got a whole jumble of things. So even if we use the word recovery, but I think we need another word like, forgive me, procovery, meaning we go into a new covery. What does covery mean? Covery must mean we are covered by a uh, secure society, by a world which is familiar, which is comfortable, which is secure. We're covered. Uh, it's covery that we're going for because we, don't, we can't trust our world when it's been disrupted, whether it be COVID or storms or whatever. Um, you know, we never thought there'd be storms, did we? Uh, I, I remember when that happened, I thought, this, uh, in 40 years, I've never had this sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to ask, Mr. Pierre, how, 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 how do we actually respond now when we're sort of almost lurching from one crisis to the next? Uh, when we're between crises, we're breeding bad crises that happen yeah. everywhere else, like fires, overseas, and what have you. And when you look at the Northern Hemisphere and think, oh my God, is this coming down here? Uh, uh, it's, you know, it's probably not going to be the same. It, nature is never predictable, is it? But, you know. What, what can we do to, you know, prepare ourselves and, and hopefully roll through the next thing? Okay, just before I answer that, I want to just talk about the state we're in during the bulk of the recovery period when we're in a state of extended stress. Now, around about this point, because I was giving a talk up in Rochester this afternoon. I suddenly can't remember whether I've said this in Rochester or here already. Uh, but that initial, uh, just tell me if I've told you this, 
in that initial response to the, the snake, there's a very primitive part of the brain that computes. I've got a problem here and if I don't do something straight away it's going to get worse. Oh! Right? And it's all fixed. So that floods the system with adrenaline and we go into, into quick response. That's going to happen whenever we get problems. You probably have a surge of that every time various things happen with your animals. So we, we'll go in and out of that. But, but we've got another situation, which is when our reptile brain says, I've got a problem here, but there's absolutely nothing I can do to solve it this afternoon, right? Like having a mortgage, which might be very worrying, but there's nothing you can do about it except get up tomorrow and go to work and stay there until knock off time and do that the next day and the next day and keep doing that for 25 years, right? That'll help the mortgage no end, which means you've got to move yourself into a very different state from responding to the snake or the fire or the storm. You've got to, instead of going into emergency mode, survival mode, you've got to go into what I call endurance mode. I'm going to have to go into a mode where I just plod steadily through. And you can see the difference on people's faces, whether they're like this or like this. They have a deadpan, unexpressive face because they haven't got enough energy to smile. What do you want? All right? You know that state? And you've been in this uh, continuous activity. You haven't had any mulling, so you start to get confused. Now, one of the most sensitive indicators of problems with your brain is memory. Did you ever, in a state of extended stress, go up to the bedroom to get something and then you couldn't remember what you got, what went up there for? Because on the way up you thought about all the other problems you've got to deal with over the next three hours. And by the time you got there, what have I come here for? And then you go back, I'm talking about myself, go back to your study and you realise, hang on a second, I can't read this computer, I've, I've left my glasses somewhere. And then you go all the way back up and you ransack the bedroom, you can't find them. And on the way back you pass the mirror and you see them sitting up on... <laughs> you know, or, or have you ever done that with a shopping list? Yes. Gone down to the supermarket, you can't find it, you go back. Because you can't remember, you have to go through your cupboards again and when you get in the car it's on the, on the dashboard. Why didn't I see it before? Someone must have moved it. Uh, you know, th this is a problem, not of memory itself, not of recording of information, but organising it so that you can retrieve it and hold goals and purposes. That's what we get by mulling. That gives us space in our mind to hold things together. We lose that. And then you get into a state where you have a lot of trouble doing the important things, which is creative thinking. Uh, strategic planning, uh, lateral thinking, problem solving, delegation. Did you ever have people coming to offer you help and you just couldn't get your head around how to organise them and you wished they'd gone away and left you to do it yourself? And the stressed person says, keeps saying, go away and leave me alone and I'll do it myself. And they work harder and harder and harder because the process of organising, I've had farmers tell me, I just wish these volunteers would go away. It's so hard to get them organised. Uh, if they actually took more time and really planned it and, and could step out of that frenetic state of feeling I've got to get all this done, they would probably make good use of them. So this, in this state, we get the extra energy to perform by a different form of arousal. It has a different chemical. Uh, it's more cortisol than adrenaline. It's complicated, but cortisol stimulates the part of the nervous system that uh, conserves, protects, grows, heals, nourishes, rather than the adrenaline, which is stimulate our organs to do what they're meant to do. Quick reaction time, huge strength, no feelings of pain, just do what you have to do. But cortisol means I also don't feel pain because I'm just in zombie mode. You know what zombie mode feels like? You just, now, you can, in the reptile brain, you're, you're very deep down. I reckon, and this is just Rob Gordon's fairy tale about the brain, but I reckon we're not up here in our creative, rational thinking process where we can make good decisions and 
long-term plans. We're in the next layer where uh, automatic things are processed, where we know the constancies are processed, the, the, the assumptions and all those things. They're not in a conscious way, they're, they're pro processed in the background. And uh, in that state we can do anything that is automatic, routine and familiar. But if it's new and different and so on, you have a lot of trouble doing it. So what people will often do is during this period, where if they get too deeply in that process, their recovery activities will be totally focused on the unimaginative task of replacing what's been lost as it was. About four or five years after uh, Black Saturday, I went to give my last talk to the St Andrews community. And there was an elderly couple that had come to several of my talks and they came up and said afterwards, you know, uh, we've rebuilt, we've used all our savings, we had a whole plan for our future to go travelling and, and, uh, and then settle down, but we've replaced our house, it's taken everything we own, so we can't go travelling, we're just stuck there now. But now we're living in our house, we realise there are heaps of things we could have done for the same money that would have made our house much nicer, more creative, we could have got the sun, we should have put a window in there, you know, and we would have had a lovely new house, but we've just replaced what we had. Because he, he said, listening to you, I, I think we rebuilt too early. Uh, now I told that story in Sarsfield after Black Summer. And sometime later, I, I met this woman who said, uh, when you said that, I realised that we were in the process of doing that. So my husband and I made a decision and we went and spent money to buy a railway. No, they had a railway carriage that survived the fire, that's right. And we spent a lot of money doing it up nicely and we said, we're going to live here until we know what we want to do. In the event, after about a year, they made a decision to completely change their lifestyle and move off acreage and buy a house in Bruthen, which is just down the road, and live in that small community uh, and have a completely different lifestyle. They had planned to do that 10 years later when they were much older. So what they've done is they've moved their whole retirement plan forward and now they've got a whole lot of other opportunities to be involved in the community and do things instead of looking after their acreage. Uh, now, you know, it, it, it's, it's a nice example of how they have actually created a, a situation where they can just take the pressure off and work out that I think recovery should be the beginning of the next phase of my life when I've been through a huge disruptive event rather than going back to where I was before. Um, and I know I've been talking for a long time, but I just want to say a, a couple of other things. This period of I call it the cortisol stress. You know, we've got two branches of our autonomic nervous system. We've got the sympathetic branch, which is energy and adrenaline and action. And we've got the parasympathetic branch, which is uh, nourishment and healing and re regenerating. If you stay in that for a long time, it's not good. A lot of the metabolic pathways don't work right and you accumulate problems in your physiology so that uh, what should work in a certain way doesn't. There was a, a group of uh, case managers from Black Saturday, uh, a small group of them told me that the previous day 60 of them had met to have their last meeting. They'd been working together for two hours, for two years very stressful work, they didn't, weren't burnt out, they weren't bereaved, but they were looking after these people. Very stressful work for them. And after two years, they had this final meeting and they started talking about, it's been stressful work, hasn't it? So they had this conversation about the stress and what their stress symptom was. One of the symptoms was, many of them had put on weight. And someone had the idea of tallying up the amount of weight that these 60 people had put on it was 500 kilos. Now, I'm bad at mental arithmetic, that's about eight kilos each. Probably some put on 20 and some took it off, but eight kilos. That's a significant alteration in your uh, 
health status. And I don't know about you, but I find it's very hard to take off. Uh, because there's a hunger in this, uh, this parasympathetic uh, arousal to nourish and, and, and you, you have this hunger for chocolate, don't you? Or coffee. Just does put the parasympathetic be along the lines of like, we keep using the word stress, but like a couple of days before when the COVID thing was announced, my niece, we had the funeral for my young niece that passed away. And so I'm going to get emotional about that. Yeah. So I feel like I've been carrying that ever since. You didn't get a chance to process it because this rode straight over it. And we didn't get a chance to comfort each other. Bereavement is a parasympathetic stress, cortisol state. Depression is a cortisol state. Loneliness is a cortisol state. Any state where our brain says, there's nothing I can do about this, I just have to endure it. Having a sick child is a cortisol state. I wish this wasn't happening, but I'm just going to have to get up every night, and, you know, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and uh, you know, healthy, responsible people lock themselves into it and do the distance. And how do you do that? You shut down the feedback system in a different way. Uh, you don't ask, you don't ask, you say, I wish I didn't have this child who's sick. No, it doesn't even enter your mind. You just go straight into what you have to do. Uh, and now, if we stay in that for a long time, we lose mulling, so we lose perspective. We also have this narrowing of attention. To do all this additional work, what do you give up? everything that is not value adding to the task, which is rest, recreation, enjoyment, social life, everything that makes life valuable and meaningful uh, and, and worthwhile. All the extras, you know, you just go into the essential. Uh, and uh, now if we, if we talk about multiple disasters, we're sort of in and out of these states we haven't got through one of them. Now, I reckon, uh, you know, uh, it's a bit, uh, a bit simplistic, but, uh, but uh, when we're in that state, we are incubating difficulties because it takes a lot of energy to be nice to each other, doesn't it? Right? So, uh, my wife goes in the kitchen, and I say in serious cortisol state, how about a cup of tea? Get your own bloody tea. What do you think? And over that little interchange, you have a big Barney. Or is that just my relationship, maybe? On. <laughs> Can you see? You generate a lot of friction because it takes energy. So one of the values we can hold is good manners, like our grandmas tried to teach us. Just go back to good manners. Just say it gently and slowly. Excuse me, dear. It would be nice to have a cup of tea, wouldn't it? Even if you don't feel like it. Uh, and and uh, so really just holding those social forms, is, it sort of oils the wheels of social interaction. And uh, I I've had to invent language. So there's been a lot of studies done about uh, how many people have post-traumatic stress, how many anxiety disorders and so on. But what I notice is the bulk, and it's about 20% in a natural disaster, between 10 and 20%. But what about all the rest of you guys? You're all having a hard time, aren't you? And uh, so I invented terminology. It's not a diagnosis, but it might lead to one. I call it degraded quality of life because I'm not enjoying life because it doesn't seem the space or energy to prioritise anything that is not giving me value for, for energy. So we lose our recreation. People will come out of this recovery process, you know, a year, two, three later, uh, and find actually their whole social network's changed. Uh, uh, there was a, a woman that uh, I worked closely with in Macedon who was involved in in the local community health centre. She'd lived there all her life. And uh, she was burnt out. And it so happened that some years later, she came to work at the Children's Hospital when I was there. And I was starting to sort of get, ask these questions to myself about long-term recovery. And one day we had, 
lunch together and I said, Mary, you've lived there all your life. And this is, you know, about four or five years later. And I said, tell me, who's still in your social network? She was a very gregarious, charming person. And I said, who's in your social network that was there before the fire? And literally, it was like a cartoon, her mouth dropped open. And she said, no one, no one. And at that time, her whole social network had changed because people hurt each other's feelings because they're all in cortisol. And they have, remember the, the diagram with the different kinds of uh, impacts. People become judgmental in cortisol. They can't take other people's point of view. They can't understand outside their own. So this is one of the problems that I think the community has to really take care of itself during the aftermath. And for that, you probably need a few leaders who, who sort of put these. And this takes us to the issue of resilience. Now, don't use that word in Rochester. Uh, uh, they had a minister come up there and say, you have to be more resilient. Every disaster affected community gets told they should be more resilient. Uh, now, I think resilient means actually recognising and being able to work with the, the real problems that we're having. And one day, I, uh, struggling to understand what it meant, I spent a, a half a day looking it up in various dictionaries. And I, it, it, you know, the, what's the colloquial term is to bounce back. It's not actually what it means. If you take it through to the Latin, have we got any Latin scholars in the room? No, I'm a safe ground there. Uh, it means to spring back. Sal means to spring. Sale, is that how you pronounce it? Which is just above it in the Latin dictionary, means reeds. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, that's, that's the key, isn't it? it? A reed is locked into the earth and it can uh, deform and flex and shift and let the water go over and then it springs back uh, because it's stayed in its roots, its roots have stayed in. The tree is too big, it gets swept away and is permanently lost. The reeds flex and deform and distort but something remains, the key structures remain intact so that they become the basis for reasserting the form of the plant when it's able to do so. Now, I think that's about our lives. And what's the equivalent? I think it comes back to what are the fundamental values in our life that we need to anchor ourselves in and not lose them. But they are at risk of getting lost in that zombie mode, that in endurance mode, because we, we let everything go, that, that, uh, that uh, we don't we don't feel gives us an immediate input. And so coming back to this multiple disasters, uh, I think we're getting a very messy process and the risk to my mind is that instead of having recovery, working to rebuild community values and qualities and the kind of community we want, we get adjustment. You know, we, if you ever, uh, like me, um, uh, you know, when, when we have disasters, I running around all the place uh, after, after hours and so on. And, uh, you know, you get up and you have your exercise routine and whatever else. And then one day you're just a bit tired and you don't do it. And then you find a month later you haven't done it. It's just simply dropped out because it requires energy and input. Or you, uh, you know, you, you, you make salads regularly and then and one day you're a bit too tired and you don't do it and then a month later you realise you haven't eaten a salad or whatever your particular... Can you see that, that, that this, this, this is what I mean by degraded quality of life, that you just lose things or you realise you, uh, you, know, you haven't had a phone call to your friends or you... All these things, just this degrading. Um, and that's a, a process of adjustment that's focusing on just holding yourself together. We all become egocentric in stress. But uh, this is, the, to my mind, where we get irreversible, unnecessary changes in our lives that are serious losses. 
And so um, I, I, I think it's really important to hang on to things. There's a very simple recipe to counteract stress, pleasure and leisure. Pleasure, enjoyment, satisfaction, achievement, fulfilment, because you're not getting that from, from the major bits of life, are you? So you have to find, where can I do this? I tell the story of this uh, big, strong uh, builder that I'm working with who has done huge uh, uh, ultra uh, marathon type uh, activities. He's had a bad trauma and he's taken up knitting. And he's brought in recently a photograph of having, he's got a new granddaughter, he's He's, he's a builder, he's a craftsman. He's knitted this beautiful little sky blue uh, cardigan for his little infant daughter with little flowers on it. And he says, isn't this great? Look what I've done. And this joy in the midst of his grief and uh, about the other issues in his life. You know, it's so important that he, he's preserving the flexibility of his emotional life moving from tragedy and grief through to joy. And just instead of just saying, oh, she's lovely, yeah, yeah, you know, getting wooden and numb and disconnected. So that's pleasure. I think we get a form of energy from pleasure that you can't get in any other way. <coughs> Not from chocolate or Mars bars, although someone in Rochester you said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> now, leisure is the mulling and carving out time where you don't have to do anything. In fact, you... You, you just do what you like. It could be Sunday afternoon or it could be the whole weekend, whatever you can manage. And do it a little bit, you know, in the evening, during the week. Just <coughs> define, I'm not gonna do any building. I'm not gonna do any insurance. I'm just gonna hang. And if you do that with your family, you'll find you'll have interesting conversations, won't you? After you've bickered and so on a bit, but. Um. So now I wanna just talk about looking forward. Um, <coughs> It's a bit of a worry, isn't it? The fire season. And now, uh, anxiety is fear of what might happen. Therefore, it's imaginary. It might be real, but I'm imagining it. And it hasn't happened there, so it's not like the snake. I can't do anything about an imaginary fear, can I? That's why anxiety is so disturbing, is because I feel helpless in the face of it. Because like my uh, traumatised uh, client, he says, yeah, but I might. You're not going to be shot again. If, and how do you know? I might. Uh, but we, we don't live that way, do we? Because otherwise we'd say, I might die on the way home. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go anywhere. Someone else better pick me up. But they might actually have a, you know, we can't live like that. So we, we have this ability to, to put a, uh, a sense of likelihood about things. I'll drive carefully and have a good car and so on. And so uh, if, we, if we get that sense of control, we can put it up against the fear. And that means we have to go into, put our energy into preparedness. And that means your plan, the most important part of your plan is maintaining this, not your pump, this, uh, your brain your mind, that means psychological preparedness. There's stuff on the uh, website of the Australian Psychological Society about uh, psychological preparedness, emotional preparedness. Uh, and it's very, and I, we haven't got time to go into it, but I think it's very important to, to see that as a way you can become active for the future, uh, to have the bag that doesn't have six pairs of bathers and a beanie in it. It's thought out um, <coughs> to, uh, to be actually thinking in terms of uh, what else do we need? Now, uh, there's a whole lot of stuff on psychological preparedness. Red Cross specialises in it. They've got a lot of literature on how to make your plan and so on. I recommend you look into it. But what uh, this American, and I'll finish with this story, what this American researcher showed was by comparing all of the prefectures up the coast of Japan for the Fukushima uh, disaster, he was able to show the one factor that best predicted the speed and completeness of recovery 
was a measure of what he calls social capital. Social capital is just social connectedness. And he measured that, not like a psychologist, but like a political scientist. How many people turn out to vote? How many people belong to organisations? How many people turn up to a meeting like this? Now, to see how that links back to the process of talking about your experience and processing it. Um, and that factor uh, 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 predicts much more accurately than the amount of money spent, the amount of political influence, the number of cabinet ministers that visited. Uh, and it also predicts the number of deaths. The more uh, uh, communities with higher social capital had fewer deaths because they're more networked. They didn't wait for authorities to, do, to tell them what to do. They did it themselves. They already had of arrangements whereby uh, I have an uh, agreement with the elderly fellow next door that if there's a problem, I'll jump over the fence, put him on my shoulders and we'll climb up the hill. Um, and now, this is something that I think is a very tangible, don't we feel better if we belong and if we know people and we, uh, he, he's got lots of stories about how uh, often lower socioeconomic uh, groups, groups, ethnic uh, groups with, that have uh, uh, emigrated or refugees, they're very closely networked because they've got to look after themselves. They recovered in New Orleans much faster than the uh, uh, middle class professional groups who didn't really know their neighbours but had friends all over the place. Um, and, and so I think what we, he said, actually, if you look at his statistics, um, the best use of money is to promote social connection, not to pour concrete. And, but in fact, we, we often have, in the aftermath of disaster, we give lots of money and people have to apply for money and projects, uh, you know, paths everywhere, haven't we? Playgrounds and all sorts of things. But I think uh, this, given absolute significance to social fabric, because if we've got that, we will not be alone, will we, when, when there's a disaster threatening. We'll have that confidence that there are people around and I don't have to do it myself. Uh, so I would say it's really important uh, to, uh, you know, start thinking about your neighbours and, and uh, make contact and you've got uh, those cards, haven't you, one of those cards called, where you can put cards, you put your details and uh, share them with your neighbour and so on. It's not where we've been, but we can't afford to stay where we've been in the last century, can we? Well, if, I suppose if you go back to the 1920s, I bet they had all that. They borrowed cups of sugar from each other, didn't they? Uh, look, um, uh, you know, the, other, the one other thing I would say is really think about what did we learn? <coughs> what did we learn? What would we do next time? Um, and, and again, sharing that with each other and thinking about street meetings. Uh, I think to be able to just get together with the people in your immediate neighbourhood, get to know each other, uh, talk about the disaster, you know, the, the plans and so on, so that you're not alone. I'll stop talking and see if anyone's got any questions. Yes, that's right. And a lot of people are saying it's not back to what it was. No, so maybe we have to make an effort. Uh, we've perhaps replaced it with electronic contacts, which probably won't help us in the middle of a flood or a storm. Farmers um, always had it. It was there in my community until these other city escapees moved in. Yeah. With all their values. Um, but maybe we've got to pull them in, pull them into relationships. They're so angry. Yeah. That is why all the farmers have disappeared. Because so, so there's a there, there's a big social tension there, which uh, would be good to try and think of a way of working with that. Uh, well, but get back to planning. They should never have been allowed to mm. build on farmland. Mm. Mm. And that if a dog's wandering and drive your animals out and then ring up council.
so we can say, oh, I'm so good with veggies. And it's just mm. endless. Um. I can see we could go into that, uh, and um, but I can, but it do, it does it does show that maybe there are tensions and issues in the community that perhaps need to be worked with, um, and uh, there are people who specialise in in that process of facilitating people to get together, and, because what brings people together is their common issue, and the the fire the flood is going to be a common issue for everyone. We have to get people beyond their little circuit. Yeah. After the Ash Wednesday fires, we learned how to prepare for fire. Yeah. Then we had the storm, totally unprepared. Yeah. Blackout for three days, everything gone haywire, no, no charging of phones. So I prepared for storm and I said to a friend, we have to prepare for fire, storm and flood. And each time a new city, we, we sort of put up a plan for the next one. Yeah. But now there's three plans. <laughs> yeah, but now what's in common? What about meteors? Well, what about earth? A meteor come and we'll all go. Yeah, well, well uh, what about earthquakes? Well, we've had a few. Yeah. Volcanoes. Now, see, what, what I think is important is to don't get tied into one no, event. I've got the plan. We have to look at what's the core thing. And uh, I think the core thing is going to be about what do you expect from uh, governments? Nothing. I think that's wise. <laughs> Don't, look, is, have your own plan. And, and do governments are usually very, very, very busy, but they can't get it all going very quickly. So. Yeah, they're constrained by money, they're constrained by legislation and all sorts of constraints. It takes time to put it all together. It takes a long time. It takes an enormous amount of time. Now, in, in the United States, when they were preparing for what they thought was going to be the big earthquake in Los Angeles, they said to people, you need to have supplies to be completely on your own for three days. And now they're saying probably a lot longer than that. You just and have a kit everywhere for each while during COVID. Well, you know, I think that that would be a starting point. And then I think the question is, what really is important? I think a question to ask when you're in this ongoing stress is, what was important, made my life valuable, meaningful beforehand on a regular basis? And am I still doing it? And if not, what am I doing instead? And when we look at disaster preparedness, think about what's really central to my life to give it its value and how do I put that into my plan, uh, you know, and, and people realise actually a lot of things they thought were valuable are not really, not important. It's, it's the people and the relationships and, and maybe mementos and history and so on rather than expensive items, uh, just, just money. Um, so, uh, the, you know, this is sort of now I think if people talk together and exchange views and and uh, everyone has different views, you start to get a complicated view and you, get, you learn from each other. Um, but then you've got, to, you've got to put the energy into it, which is, oh, do we turn out to another meeting? I've got, I want to watch something on TV. Uh, but we've got to disrupt ourselves. I should stop talking, we should have a cup of tea. Can, can you have a cup of tea? Thank you very much.